Hi, everybody. Ricky here from Behind the Bars TV. And today's guest is all the way from Australia. He's going to share his experiences about his time in the maximum security prisons over in Australia and how he uh, get to where he is now and turn his life around. But uh, Rick, if you'd just like to introduce yourself. Yeah, how you going, people? My name's uh, Rick Zaccanini, obviously Italian background with a name like that. And uh, I was born and bred in Melbourne and uh, I still live here today. Pretty much only a K from the house where I was uh, born in. Um, had a pretty sort of uh, harsh background growing up. I was born in a criminal family. My dad and his twin brother were both standover men when they were younger. And then as they got a little bit older into their early 20s, they stepped into armed robberies. Um, so, yeah, I was always sort of around that sort of lifestyle as a kid. Really? And, um, yeah. But my dad always... He always pushed me to stay at school, me dad, you know what I mean? Even though, you know, I was around all that, he didn't want me to become that. So like you see, when you're there, when you're growing up around that sort of influences, it's only leading one way, isn't it? When you're, obviously, if you've got people around you like that, you look up to your dad, don't you? Because obviously I was the same with my dad and ultimately that's what ends up sometimes how what lands you're in prison, looking up to the wrong role models, isn't it? Yeah. That's exactly right, Ricky. Couldn't be said uh, better. Um, Did you have a good life? Yeah, so I went, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, my my father, I mean, my my father done well, obviously. With you know, um, right, he, I'm not going to lie; it's all fact. He owned two houses by the time he was 21. Like, owned them outright. So. Like, yeah, um, but he did his fair share of stints in and out of Pentridge as well as a younger as a younger bloke. And, um, yeah, as he got to about, he wasn't until he probably got to about his 40s, he started to settle down a bit. Um, well, security, well, well, cameras, everything, it just became harder to rob banks, you know, as the years went on. So was he still going to prison when you were like a young young boy growing up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you yeah, my, my grandma, my grandma pretty much raised me. She was like my mother. And did you go out to visit your dad in prison? Because my dad's. Did you go out to visit? Yeah, yeah, my grandma, prison, right? yeah, yeah. My grandmother used to take me in because my dad's my mum at the time like left. She had enough. Enough was enough, you know. So many sentences and whatever, and I mean. Uh, you know, I remember being in the bedroom and hearing him in their bedroom beating her and stuff like that. And, you know, just, yeah, she just had enough of it over so many years, I think, stuck around probably longer than she did being, it was Italian family and, you know, how they frown on divorce and stuff. Oh, right. I get, yeah, I saw it. So what was it like? Yeah, but I think. What yep. was it like for you when you were going into prison to see your dad in there? Um, As a kid, like, I was scared like I was going in with my grandmother but I was still like intimidated but also very curious you know I'd be always asking me dad questions when we'll be having visits you know like oh you know what's that bloke in for what's that bloke in for you know oh what's this what's that you know me old man would be just shut up mind your own business you know <laughs> <laughs> did he ever did he ever like glamorize prison you make it out as if it was something good or no no, nah, did you nah, try, nah. try and deter you from it? Yeah, yeah, and, and that's why he pushed me like hard with school, like uh, after primary school, which I go into hit high school. Um, he sent me to a pro expensive private boys college out in the country, right? Um, because I was already started get, getting, you know, police rocking up to our house, you know, rah, 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 looking for me for little bits and pieces. Nothing serious at that stage. But um, I ended up deliberately getting expelled. So after two years, I had enough of me fighting and just expelled me and just kicked me out anyway. So needless to say, my father was none too happy about that, but that's where I picked up my apprenticeship. And, uh, yeah, I just managed to scrape through that. And I really am glad I did when I look back now that I, I you know, out 10 years now and I've had that back to fall, fall yeah. on. Admittedly, I was on bail while I was doing my apprenticeship. Right, but, so yeah, I, I got pinched. I got pinched and remanded four months after I finished it. So what was but the, I was already on one can of bail while I was doing it. What was your your area like growing up? Because is it 
obviously because well, uh, Lalo was... Thomas, Lalo, yeah, Lalo Thomas Town was a lot of ethnics, Italians, Greeks, uh, a mix of Aussies. Like there was a street gang, the Thomstown Sharps. They were like skinheads. This is a set sixties, seventies, and eighties. Um, Chopper Reed lived only bloody two k. Him and he knew my old man until they were about sixteen, yeah. and then <laughs> Chopper sort of went his way doing his standover thing, and my old man and his twin brother went their way doing their standover thing. Right, so we lived in the same neighbourhood. Yeah, yeah, mate. Layla or Thomas down, yeah, next door to each other. Yeah. And back then, like, they're large outer suburban ta- towns now. But back in the 70s, they were very small. Like, Epping was almost a country town, and Layla and Thomas town were just very small, upcoming suburban towns with new immigrants. But everybody's heard of uh, Chopper. Well, obviously, he got famous through his movie, didn't he? And they uh, had quite a few. Yeah, movies. of course. Yeah, and and even before the, the movie, anybody who knew him, like, yeah. you know, knew what he was about. But but the wider public definitely got to um, see, you know. Is he put, portrayed properly in the film? Is that the way he was? Yeah. Uh... I mean, sir, yeah, his mannerisms and stuff, definitely. Yeah. Or like in, in that movie, there was definitely liberties taken with exaggeration and stuff on some of the scenes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but like his sense of humour, um, he's, he's like like cut his own ears off. Yeah. As I said, I used, <laughs> I used to date the niece of the bloke that cut his ears off. He was there. Like, yeah, all well, that sort of the psychopathic side of him, you know, like that, that that's all true. That's really? all true. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Crazy man. Yeah. Dangerous. Passed away now, but yeah. So going back to when you were like a young, young lad getting into trouble, what sort of things were you starting to get into? Uh, mainly just um, like shop, shoplifting, um, sort of when I was a young kid, like 14, I was like, yeah, not. I mean, people would leave their doors open back in the seventies. It wasn't like you're breaking into a stranger's house, but like I was a young kid, I'd just take all their change, yeah. you know, and I'd have money to go and play the penny machines for the day, you know what I mean, the pinball machines. But it just it did start like that, stealing push bikes, swapping and trading hot push bikes with kids and that, yeah, you know, stuff like that, yeah. And were you using drugs and drinking alcohol at this time? No, mate. No, mate. I did not touch heroin till I turned eighteen when my grandmother died. As she said, as I said, she pretty much raised me like a, you know, another son. Right. Um, I mean, I knew, knew my whole life she was my grandmother growing up. Nobody tried yeah. to, you know, say I'm see mother or anything. I knew all that, but um, yeah, that really hit hard. Like I was smoking weed by then, and you know, someone put it, you know, if you have it, it'll be like having 50 hash bongs at once. That was the enticement that got me to want it to try it when it was put to me like that. Sort of. You know, with, with my grandmother dying and that, yeah, I, I definitely, I, I did purposely go out. I didn't know anybody. I had to go, out, you know, it took me like three or four weeks before I could even find somebody that could ring somebody that might know somebody that could get it off somebody else, you know. Yeah. It was like, yeah. So when did you first get the experience of the prisons? Or when did you first go? Uh, yeah, well, uh, when I was, uh, like I said, uh, I just managed to finish my apprenticeship for, by four months. I was like just 18, just past 18. And um, I went to jail for 18 months for two car thefts and two burglaries, residential burglaries. Um, like... Yeah, I started hitting the smack. She died pretty much when I turned 18, only like three or four days afterwards. And within four months, like, yeah, I breached my bail and I was locked back up. So I did 18 months first time, no YTC because I stuck out my apprenticeship. So I didn't come up with the youth into the adult system, you know what I mean? But through the drug scene, I knew a fair few of them anyway. So at that age, is it, uh, is it like it is in the UK? Is it like a young offender prison? Uh, they have young offender prisons. Yeah, it's, it was called Tirana back then in the day here, the YTC, Youth Training Camp. And the maximum security part of it was called Tirana Class A. Yeah. And it was in, in the yeah. minimum parts of the youth part, um, like they get for weekend leaves and stuff like that, go home for the weekends and then come back and all sorts of things like that. 
And is that um but like Pentridge back then there was no youth section or anything like so was that up until you're 21 year old, then you go to the adults prison? Yeah, yes. Or depending on your crime or if you're a big lad for 18 or whatever, they can still they can still legally back then they could send you to Pentridge at 17 and nine uh, oh, right. and nine months. And so, there were kids who got just hectic hit kids who did get sent there at that age. Yeah. So what was it like for you going to prison for the first time? How were you feeling? Well, I was packing myself because like like I said I didn't come up in the youth system so it's not like I would have known heaps of young blokes that were, had made it to jail from the youth system as a lot of them all do know each other when they hit the adult system yeah. but what I did have on my side sort of <clears throat> was a lot of the older crooks remembering my dad and his twin brother and right. my name being so uncommon you know and I guess so well known around those suburbs in the early days and that they were very staunch men and you know, so I got pulled under older crook's wings straight away as a young bloke, right. you know, and shown the ropes and everything. Oh, it went in your favour. Yeah, yeah, it did. That, 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 yeah, for, for, for a change, it did oh. work going in my favour, yeah. <laughs> so what's it like in the rear, the white But, team? I mean, I'm not, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a loud man for a carry-on. I'm pretty likable, yeah. you know. I get along with most blokes, you know what I mean? Yeah. So what was it like the, in there? Was yeah, it the youth training camp. There was a violence in there. Fighting. In Pentridge. No, and the and the young offenders like the youth training camp is a loads of violence in the out of oh, Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Like, not that I went there, like I said, but my, I had mates that did, and yeah, oh, yeah, right. it was yeah. So where was it yeah, you like went I said, the first time? Pentridge, straight oh, to Pentridge, Pentridge at 18. Right. Yeah, because yeah. I did my apprenticeship. I was still oh, right. I stayed yeah. in yeah. Like so, I said, I was on bail. Doing my apprenticeship the last couple of months, but I got through it. My grandma died about two weeks later at 18, and I hit the smack hard, and within four months, I'd breached my bail and locked up, got sentenced on those two bergs, the two cars, yeah. got 18 months, straight to Pentridge. Is Pentridge here, yeah, like HMP? Does that come under HMP? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it was built in, like, 1859 or something, old I've Bluestone. I've seen a few uh, photos of it. Like It's like an old Victorian prison, isn't it? Is yeah, it like yeah, yeah. It was massive too, mate, massive. So what category is that? It's maximum. The whole, it was never had never had a medium section in it. The whole jail used to be just maximum. And is that one of the toughest prisons in Australia? Oh, dear. Well, it would have been back in the day, especially in the, like the 70s and 80s and even the 90s. Like in the 80s, like late 80s to early 90s, in B Division, there was that that much violence that the um they had an ambulance parked full time out the gate 24-7. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of having to call one to come, you know, from an ambulance station or whatever, they just had one parked there 24-7. Yeah. Madness, yeah. So yeah, pretty crazy. Listen, even when I was there, I yeah, some some hectic stuff, especially when like uh you know, Rohypno Rowies, those pills. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, or Xanax, like same sort of thing. Oh right, got your when they, yeah, when they used to get the tennis balls of them used to come over the walls, like mate, I used to just lock my door in my in my cell, mate, and just stay in my cell. I bet that some of the shit one. that I bet that made everyone a lot more violent with them sort of tablets. Oh, mate, mate, I see it's some cool. guy. Because back then they were using the, the squeeze mop buckets, but they were the old metal ones still. Right, I got you. But I seen a guy get half his head caved in with one, Rick. No oh. shit, mate. Yeah, in a, in a division, down the showers. Because a rumour was that he was a fucking pedophile. Like, turns out he wasn't. Like, just... Pilled, you know, like people talk, talk, and everyone's pilled. And next thing you know, some poor blokes getting their head caved in and not even what they are. There was that's another, what I'll never, in prison, I'll never like, forget this. Yeah, go. That's what happens in prison sometimes, doesn't it? You get some people get falsely accused and without taking any, uh, finding out. No, not even asking him, yeah. Not even yeah. going and asking him, like, yeah. Yeah, or even asking going to the screws, like, the screws would give you a heads up and that, you know. Because yeah. back then, like, Pentridge didn't have protection. 
they'd just be locked in certain cells 23 hours a day. And have you over in Australia, is it like the same system here? Is it like category A, B, C, and like D? Yeah. Yeah. You've heard me talk about Fulham Prison. Fulham. Yeah, yeah. that's here. Yeah. Yeah. Is that that's that um maximum security. That's a medium. Medium. That's a medium security prison, but it's all got also got a C section. Um it, it's still inside the walls. But they get to go outside and work on the tractors, mow the lawns. They go to work in a dairy and milk cows, and just come back at the end of the day and that. But double cut ears cause it also leaves it also leaves it open for a lot of contraband to come in too, like that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, double cut ear over there has caused something different, isn't it? Uh, a asterisk. Asterisk. Oh, I thought so. You yeah. A a asterisk. Yeah, so uh, that's all I'm saying. That's whenever you go on a transport, you're shackled from your ankles, your hands, and there's a chain from your ankles up to the chains on your cuffs, and you've got a big belt around you, and then those cuffs are cuffed to that belt as well. And do they still do that to this deer? Cuff them up like that, do they? Yeah, yeah, mate, a bar one, yeah, and that's even if you're just going for a medical appointment, mate, or really? a court, you know, court hearing, anything. It's like something you hear from the American. Yeah, prison, you know? of, yeah that, that mainly happens at uh, Barwon Prison, which is our, I mean, Port Phillips maximum as well. Um, but that's, you know, it's just a huge mix of remand, protection, sentence prison as Port Phillips. It's just the whole so mishmash. Barwon's. Whereabouts are those prisons at? Hey? Whereabouts are those prisons at? Are they in Melbourne as well, or are they? Yeah, all these are all in Melbourne. These ones I'll talk right. about the interstate ones after the Melbourne ones. Right. Um, yeah, Barwon's got um, it's max, but then it's got the super max section inside it called Malaluka. All the units there are named after native Australian plants. So you've got Banksia, Diosma, Malaluka, um, Grevillea, like all, all units like that. And Malaluka is where, like, Tony Mockbell, Carl Williams, when he first went there, all the high profile, all the, the um, extreme, ter you know, terrorist people that have been caught here in Melbourne are there. Um, the dangerous, super dangerous crooks that can't be on the yard like that. Matty Johnson from the POWs, he started in Malaluka. Um, all those type of criminals. I've been into the slot at Barwon in Acacia, but that's not super max. That's just normal maximum slot. Well, just for the viewers back here in the UK, because I know a lot of people haven't seen the series Underbelly, but obviously I've seen it. Um, yeah. Carl, Carl Williams was in the first series, wasn't he, with Mark Bell? Yes. Um, yeah. So yep. did you ever come across Carl Williams? Way up, but... Um... I was locked up when Carl got killed, but not. I wasn't at Barwon. I was at Port Phillip at the time. But the funny thing is, the way he got killed with the exercise bike, that same bloke had bashed another guy to death like that already in jail before. Yeah. The same way. So they knew, you know, that was his M.O., so Carl Williams had killed a lot of people, hadn't he? Because did was he not down as the biggest serial killer? Yeah, yeah. He 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 ordered a lot of hits. He done one or two himself, but he yeah. paid people to do the majority of them. I see. When I see him the film, I can't remember how many, but he was responsible for quite a lot of murders, wasn't he? Yeah, I think it was about eleven or something. Right, all right. So um, so when he got to the prison, that's when he got murdered, wasn't it? That you've just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Because once you've been in management unit for a long time on your own, you go into what's called long term management, where you're out three hours a day and they let you mix with two other prisoners. Right. So. <clears throat> and that Matthew Johnson that killed him befriended Carl. But um, Carl had made deals with the cops. To, when he pleaded to all these things, they were going to pay for his kids' private school fees and all that. And it was all true. It was in the papers and that. Maddie found out. 
that he was like an informant working for the police, even though he was locked up at that stage. And, yeah, he hates informants. So, yeah, he bashed him to death. So what sentence did he receive? But probably knew he was going to get a lot more notoriety from knocking him as well. <laughs> what sentence did he receive for that? Uh, 35 years. 35 years, are. Did they have, mm. um, did they have like, a whole life sentence in your country like they do here? Like, life without parole? Um, oh, Governor's Pleasure, it's called here. Oh, right. GP, as it's known. And it's not handed out very often. There's only a few people on it now, and they're older ones that have been on it for years. There was a few more, but they uh, took them to court and got it overturned. There's one bloke I know on it, and he's a horrible individual, Butch, his name is, but um, he's an Aboriginal person. Um, raped a lady, stalked and raped the lady, a doctor. Got six years for it. Got out, stalked and raped the same lady again six weeks later yeah. after he got out from doing the six years. So they gave him governor's pleasure never to be released. Right. So what a piece of work, huh? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Most of the ones that are on it are bad pedos or people like that. No, people have to deserve Nobody it. for violence or, you know, like bankrupt. No, no, nobody's on it for anything like yeah. that. It's mainly just kept for people like that. So how long just did horrible you... people. Sorry. Yeah, so just, yeah did... just horrible people. Yeah. How long did you end up serving altogether? Did you serve? In Pentridge. Like all, uh, all together? Yeah, well, I, I got after the first one, 18 months, <laughs> the next one was for armed robbery. So I did uh, five with a seven or seven with a five, which is five on the bottom, two years parole. Right. And another bloke robbed the stuck up a post office, uh, shot was let go into the roof, got away, everything like that. <clears throat> got snitched by a bloke that used to live in the same block as, of flats as us. Um, yeah, we hardly spoke to the guy and that, and like he always used to come over and ask for stuff and that. And he just not that we were flash with the money, we were both addicts, you know what I mean? But he just realized we weren't going out doing crime every day to support our habits, and just I don't know, he just obviously led the jacks onto us. And about six weeks after the armed robbery, we got pinched. You served five years for that one, yeah, from '93 to fucking. What, 98? And whereabouts did you go on this sentence? Pentridge. Pentridge, yeah. Yeah, but then I did end up getting a medium rating and I went to another prison that Ararat, it's called. It was HMP Ararat, which is now after, yeah, like in the 90s sometime, um, they changed it. I think it was like the right at the end of the nineties before two thousand. They changed it to a jail for all sex offenders and pedophiles and police and you know people like that. Yeah. It happens to a lot of jails. All the good jails here, they take it off mainstream and they give them to the protection prisoners. The protection prisoners get treated better in the the Victorian prison system than the mainstream prisoners. But to see them over here, they seem to get more privileges, don't they? Because oh, is it? Oh, to see them. They seem to get more. Yeah, they get put on the best wish. Bullshit. Like, uh, yeah. If a new in... unit's built, they'll get it. Exactly the same here. Here, HMP Durham. Uh, um, F wing it is now. It's the best wing on the in the jail. The newest. Yep. And the, the sex offenders are on there. No. Uh, Makes you sick. They, they seem to treat them better than the treat. Yeah, I'll tell you different here, mate. Uh, All right. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No different here, buddy. No different at all. So what happened after that sentence? Did you did you sort yourself out when you got out of prison? Well, go straight back. No. Well, that's well, that's when I went into state. Well, I tried to. I tried to. But I actually completed my parole. <clears throat> yeah. Because when you're on parole, you need exceptional circumstances to go to another state or travel or anything. But did me parole. Pulled me head in, um, went, went and lived with, back with me uh, mum, who I hadn't seen for a while because my grandma raised me because my father took me sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so I stayed there, got my head together, got off parole, said, right, I'm I can travel clean. 
off to Queensland I went. Worst mistake I ever made in my life, mate. Um, pro- in this little talk, I'll I'll tell you about the story. The only time in my life where I, Ricky, where I genuinely thought I was going to die in prison. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. We're up Queensland. It was two uh two of us. We met another bloke who we made mate friends with up there. Bit of a hectic sort of dude that we met in a pub. Um. Oh, what's that shit town called? The Red Light. Oh, anyway, the, like the Red Part Light District sort of part of Queensland of Brisbane. You know, so we started hanging around with him, getting an old undesirables and this and that. And, you know, before we knew it, back on the drugs again. So out of money up in Queensland, don't know nobody. Decide, going to do them arm robbery. Do it, get away, no drama. Have a stolen car, get rid of, out of that car, burn it, jump in another car, drive, fucking hide that car in a garage, and then just get out and walk back to the apartment we're staying at. Well, the bloke that we're hanging out with was known to police in Brisbane. Um, fucking somehow from CCTV, they managed because we're not from there, so they don't know our faces. We're bellied up in that. Like fucking, I think one had a cap and sunglasses. I don't think we're like full, full balaclava. Yeah. But from the CCTV, they were able to finger him. Didn't know who the hell we were. Busted him. He lagged me, me mate. We end up getting sentenced up there. Um, end up getting 18 months. Uh, that was to serve, I think it was two and a half on top, something like that. So like six month parole period. And that was lucky they didn't have our Victorian history. Like now, I think pretty sure with so much technology is all linked. But back then in the 90s, still all the states weren't linked here. So we're very lucky. But anyway, the the, the Queensland system, mate, that is something I'll never forget for the rest of my life. And what prison was that? I ended up at, hey? What prison was this? Uh, I ended up in a prison called Sir David Longlands. It got closed down. It's uh, been reopened recently as, I think, Bridge, Brisbane Correctional Centre or something. But the reason it got closed down is because of all the murders that were in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was a group of indiv- young individuals in this prison known as the Angry Gang. Um, you know, white shaved head. I, mean, I just look like me or you. Like, But young kids getting... So Stood uh, so sick of being stood over by older, you know, crooks and that. Yeah. I mean, not older crooks, but just blokes that are older and bigger around than that. So they all decide to stick together. One of the main bullies on the wing one day decide <clears throat> they're going to murder him. Everybody knew about it. The screw, Jim Screw that day even took the day off sick, didn't show up. They end up murdering this bloke in the gym. That was just the start of it. Then all of a sudden, there's all these other younger blokes, you know, in the, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, want to join the angry gang, recruiting members. How do you become a member? You have to kill somebody. But oh. They created a, a system of prison serial killers. Yeah. <laughs> serial killers in prison, Ricky. Crazy. Not my God. <laughs> so I've never heard of anything like this before in the prisons over there. Not in a mo- maybe third world country like Colombia, as we've spoken, Ecuador, but not this is Australia, you know what I mean? This is like mid uh, 90s, late 90s, you know what I mean? Even early 2000s. And were they getting aware of these murders as well? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Bloody yeah. <clears throat> oath they were. Bloody oath they were. And even if they did get um like charged for them, they were beating them. Yeah, crazy. It's like that prison was. It didn't they knew where all the blind spots were and that it didn't it was getting starting to get a little bit old it wasn't as well built as, as newer prisons are today <laughs> everything like that I think that's the whole reason that prison ended up getting closed down but the situation that led to me wasn't having drama with the angry gang but I was in my cell minding my own business two of them went in there strangled an Aboriginal fellow to get it to death with the aerial cord. 
Next thing you know, I'm getting heat from the Aboriginals. Who was it? Who was it? Who was it? Who was it? I don't know enough and I didn't see enough enough. I don't know, you know, your fucking door was open. We know you know who it was. You know who it was. Mate. <laughs> oh, I bet that was a scary thing, <laughs> mate. Mate, and, and I can't, you know, and, and if I mention the, the two, they're part of that gang. I, I, I'm a fucking dead man, you know, like, you know what I mean? I'm up in Queensland. I don't know no one up there, mate. You know what I mean? They hate us up there. Like Mexicans, they call us Do in they? Queensland. It's not like like Queenslanders, New South Wales and Victoria, we all get along. It's like we're different countries almost, Rick. Really? Like that, huh? <laughs> when, yeah. So when you land in an, another state in prison, you've really got to keep your head down and sort of watch yourself, you know what I mean? First thing I did was just king hit a screw, Ricky. Yeah. <laughs> I was fearing for my fucking life, mate. There was no way I was hitting that yard. Yeah, so, yeah, just leading on from that incident, yeah, after I belted the screw, I went straight into the slot. And then um, I asked for the governor and then I asked for the Classo board to come down to the slot to see me while I was down in the slot. And um, listen, I explained the situation to them without it, giving any names up. And like, yeah, they they were not aware of what the prison, the internal move they had done. Yeah. You know, they don't have to notify Classo unless Classo ordered them to move a prison internal between prison and prisons. So they didn't know that I was getting moved and put in that situation. So oh, yeah, luckily yeah. enough, they stepped in and got me reclassified to a medium security prison out, out in uh, outskirts of Brisbane. I bet you were but, glad. Uh, that was enough of my Queensland prison there. adventure, mate. That is one. It is definitely the most dangerous prison system in Australia. Yeah. My, I bet you were glad to get out of there. Am I right? Yeah, it just keeps breaking up a little bit, just the reception. Yeah, crappy weather here too, and we're a long way away, mate. <laughs> just a bit. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, just a tad. So I bet you were glad to see the back of that prison. Mate, the back of that state. I was out of there, mate. Once I got released, I went back. I, I can't go back because I still owe whatever the fucking parole is on that sentence. Um, yeah. And uh, New South Wales, I only spent like a month in New South Wales. I was in Silverwater Prison, which is there's a remand section and then it's medium. So I just spent my time in remand. It's called MRRC. Um, absolute shit. Shittest of the shithole fucking remand centers I've ever been in out of the three states. Um, was on, on two stolen cars, ended up getting bail, and yeah, pissed off back to Melbourne and never been back to been back. New South Wales since. So, so yeah, I really didn't have any drama or you know, really any hectic stories about my time in New South Wales. Like I said, I was only in the one jail there in Silverwater, and I was there for a month, and then you know. Got out on bail and never went back to the court for the Does court that case. Still exist. S sorry. Is that the angry mob? Do they still exist, or was that just? No, no, no. They, uh, I think, two or three of them did eventually end up getting charged for for a couple of murders, and then they dispersed them all over the. Yeah. Like all over the prison system. When you mentioned before, um, just for the viewers back in the UK, the POW, which is a prisoners of war. Yeah, they're, they're a bar. When... How long has this gun been around? And do these, is this throughout over, Australia? Over 20 years. And does is this throughout the system through Australia or is it just certain? POWs are just at Barwon. Oh, oh, right. They're scattered in a few other prisons um, around Victoria, but generally... Because of who they are, the Classo board has certain prisons just for them where because they've got a lot of enemies, like they've got this GFAM gang and, you know, a couple of other, they've had drama with Lebanese gangs as well in jail. Um, so, like, Barwon's their prison where they all get sent 
And so then Classo, any of the other gangs that are the maximum security, they'll go to Port Phillip. So that, that video that I posted on a while back about the, the inmates fighting in the prison, was that Port Phillip? Yeah. Was that Port Phillip? Yeah. Because it was that... Yeah, that was P.O.W. That was Yeah, them. P.O.W. Yeah. yeah. Because in the video, it looked as though they were just fighting with a yeah. fist, but they were stabbing them, wasn't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, nah, razor blades. Oh, razor that blades in tooth... Melted in toothbrushes, yeah. Just keep slicing. I've actually, I... I I, uh, I've managed to smuggle these out of prison. Eh? I've got my old ID card from Port <laughs> Phillip Prison. And you know, oh, you know how we're talking about GEO? Actually, yeah. what they became after that was G4 Securitas. Oh, right. Transporting the prison. I, I think you've had them over there too. They yeah. used to transport us into the prisons. But this, that's that's a Port Phillip prison card. Oh, all right, all right. Yeah, that's your ID card that you have to carry oh. carry everywhere with you. It's an old one, yeah, a bit younger, but a bit bit a bit more hair back then. <laughs> but that number, like you've got that for the rest of your life, and yeah. people can pretty much tell how much jail you've done by that number. Mine's a five digit number. I think now they're up to like five hundred thousand or something like that. Is it? I <laughs> fucking hell. Yeah. I, back in my day, I, I met one or two back then. They were in their sixties, crooks that had like a three-digit CRN. So they were around when Pentridge first introduced the okay. CRN system. And here I've got this is me, me one from Barwon. That's me. That's actually got HMP Barwon on that one. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's me Barwon one. That was uh. Just after I went back to Bar when I came down to Port Phillip. Yeah. I was one out on my own at Port Phillip and I'd had an incident with this bloke, the sentence before, where he was led around a corner and a rock was smashed over his head. I mean, prison's prison, Ricky. Yeah. Um, I left it at that. Another bloke gave him a couple while he was on the ground and took his runners and that. But Standing in dessert line one night for tea, just minding my own business. He must have come in off an escort. I was out in the yard, whatever, didn't know he was in the unit. Had me guard down, whatever. Come up behind me, fucking whop, fucking razor blade straight across my neck here. Yeah, fucking hell. Crazy, huh? So what happened after that, did you? Obviously yeah, yeah. But but well, I I proceeded to run to the pool cue table, grab a pool cue, and then fucking chase him around the unit while he was running around the screws box. Fucking uh -huh. help, help, help! <laughs> fucking blood pissing out of my neck everywhere, and didn't hit an artery or anything. But you've been lucky. You know, yeah, yeah. Well, that, I guess if it had been deeper, you know what I mean? If you had the balls to actually rip it in there, you know what I mean? It could have been certainly a lot worse. <laughs> it was a hut. You could see he's, I guess he felt the pressure was on him to redeem himself from his mates or whatever, but the way he did it, it's just like his heart wasn't really <laughs> in it. He wasn't made of that sort of stuff, yeah. you know what I mean? Luckily. <laughs> no, all right, still, still the screws free because it was there were just generally was a lot of blood, even yeah. though it wasn't deep. You get a decent slash across your throat, it'll still bleed a bit. And um, you know, you got white t-shirts and that as well, like green tracksuit, white t-shirts, green jumpers. But um yeah, yeah, a few four days in hospital, and I think it was uh 16 stitches or something. Yeah. Yeah, so what, um... yeah, so it was what was uh, did you did you do bigger sentences after the when you come back from Melbourne or um when I got back to Melbourne the the next biggest one I did was five with three and a half years that was for a home invasion it was meant to be a soft target a gay bloke selling ec ecstasy who was meant to have a lot of cash at hand uh, made me mate go there just kick the front door straight in. Um. Yeah, this bloke was a bit more prepared than he we thought. He made it to the kitchen, had a swing with a carving knife. Oh, I can't really show you. I can. Uh, 
put my hand up like that and he sort of, the knife, there's the scar there, came down across there, nearly yeah. took half my thumb off. <laughs> um, yeah, my mate come over the top with a mini crowbar, one of them small crowbars. It's only like, you know, yeah, foot yeah. and a half long or whatever. Smacked him straight across the head, knocked him clean out, ransacked the house, found the money, took the ecstasy. But my DNA was fucking from arsehole to breakfast oh, through the house. Blood all over. <laughs> yeah, mate, blood all over, blood all over. And then it was almost to a stage, fuck, I really need to see a doctor about this thumb. I'd let it go a week and it's just like, yeah. Oh, but I knew the jacks would be looking for me and that. Yeah. But, yeah, I had to go into hospital and get a big flap was hanging off. I just, I had to, yeah, I had to go to hospital. There's no point, you know, gets infected. Next thing you know, you're getting it amputated or something, bloody without your thumb, you're screwed. So, yeah, had to go to hospital. Did you sample any any of the E's? (laughs) Did you take any? No, no, no. I don't. I've I've never had one. I don't get into them, eh? (laughs) No, oh. no, I can't say I've ever had a decent E. Tried one. No, we were just just the cash, just the cash, oh, and then sold the E's, sold the E's on to another the bloke that actually speared us into him, <laughs> he, oh, and man. so gave him the E's, and yeah, we kept the the cash, eight grand, I think we got the two of us. So yeah, so but like I said, yeah, it was about three weeks later, I got arrested for that. And done yet? Did you serve five years off that? Yeah, three and a half with a five. But oh, I ended yeah. up doing, I ended up doing all my parole on that one too. Because as I mentioned to you, Ricky, over here in Australia, I, I, I don't know about it in England, but do you get street time allocated to you? Yeah, and what happens is it used to be like if you got five years, you would serve half of it and do the rest on parole. But if you got recalled, you could end up serving the full five. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. See, but well, there's yeah. no change it where it's two thirds. You serve. All oh, right. Here, once you're eligible for parole, just say you do all your courses, blah, blah, blah. Yep, we're going to grant your parole. Get out on your date. Now, just say you re-offend after six months. You get dragged back in on a breach of parole. That's six months you've been on the street. That's for zero. You're back to square one again. Oh, all right. Got so some office. people, it can take them 10 years to finish a 12-month parole because they just keep on getting breached and... You just get dragged back to the start again. Oh, crazy that, isn't it? Fucking hell. It's no incentive to do parole. That's no. why the last few paroles, I, I think I mentioned in one of your, some of your content, I, I just wrote the parole. But that's what I wrote in the letter. Stick your parole up your ass. I'm not no. doing it. You know, every time I'm going to get breached, I've got to come back to the start again. I'd rather oh, just do the lot and get out a free man. Do the whole lot and then get out without it. Yeah, mate, it, it, and I, I reckon it's what was able to help me break the cycle this time and and not come back, not just – I mean, I was in that right mindset too of not using drugs, like as well as being out of prison. I've been clean for 10 years as well. Yeah, well done. Um, well, longer, longer because my last sentence was like fucking 18 months, so like probably close to 11, nearly 12 years clean. But, um, yeah, I just – I don't know, mate. It's <laughs> so was that was that your yeah. last sentence? Then when when was your last sentence? Did you see her? Like yeah, yeah. two thirteen, two thirteen. But got out like uh, late two fourteen. So what was it that made you think that's that's me doing my prison? I'm not going back. Um, basically, uh, just. I don't know. My aunt, like, listen, when I went to prison, I, I was 20, you know, I look in the yard at 20, see the 30 year olds and say, nah, I'm not going to be like that. Then I'd be in the yard at 30, looking at the 40 year olds saying, nah, I'm not going to be like that. And then in the yard of 40, fuck, looking at the 50 and 60 year olds saying, I'm not going to be. <laughs> I just thought, fuck, this is going to go on forever, mate, you know? So just a it was just changing cycle. that. I, I don't know, that, that, that mental mindset you know I, I don't know I just you know I was determined not to use again I was just I don't know I was just sick of it all mate sick of losing everything and having to restart every time like if you're not with someone solid and you're just sort of floating around doing your own as soon as you get arrested the first thing most people come and do is steal all your stuff mate nice you know if you haven't got a solid base or any you know and you got bits and pieces here and there like that's that's 
That's that's so called friends. You know what I mean? Like, so every time I've gotten out, I've had to start from scratch again. And I thought I don't want to be sixty, and and on top of that, just sixty with jail. But sixty, what? Still fucking putting needles in my arm at sixty years of age? Oh. For f- like, no way, mate. You know what I mean? Well done. Just, you have to be enough getting doing a uh, ten years clean. Yeah, yeah, no, nah, I'll fucking look back, mate. I'm fucking proud. Fucking oath I am, mate. I'm real proud. Real proud. But, you know, like I said, there's some stuff, mate. Like, you know, you've done that much jail. There's a lot of stuff, mate. Like, shit, you'll just never forget, eh? I, like, seen some horrible, horrible things, mate. Like, I remember when I was in um, B Division for a little while, um, just for about three months before I could get back into A Division, because I was given dirty urine, so I got moved out of A Division into B Division. And I had to give three clean urines before I could get back in A Division. Um, mate, they fucking set this bl- taught, poured petrol on this bloke and set him on fire, eh, right, in the cell. Yeah, that- and I, like, I just remember he- hearing the screams, Rick, and the smell, and, mate, just horrific shit. And, like, I just, even the cell afterwards, like, days afterwards, still just stunk, hey, and they... Took them a few days to paint it. It was just still the black scorch of the outline of the body of him curled up in the fetal position and that. And again, supposed pedo, fucking pedo, pedophiles, he was doing three months for parking fines. Fuck yeah, in hell. Crazy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, I've seen. You used to like to use hot oil over there. Over here, we used to like use honey, sugar, Melt it and all you down. mix it up. Yeah, boil it to, in the microwave till it is boiling and it fucking just sticks to you like napalm, eh? I've seen a person cop that in the face too, and it, it's like you describe it with the oil. Yeah. Their whole face just starts peeling from their skull down to their chin, man. You know, running around the unit, scream, and they can't even see. About to run off the balcony because they just can't see where their ruts are going because they're screaming and well, the thing yeah, is, just as well. Doesn't matter what you try and do to wait or anything, it'll not come off, will it? So it's just stuck to your face, isn't it? Yeah, it's just stuck to you. The the sugar just like caramelizes, just oh. sticks to you, and once it starts drying, like oh, what yeah, mate, some na- nasty, nasty stuff. Yeah. And like the time I was saying, at medium at Fulham, um, yeah, we're sitting at Fulham. You have the units at, at the back. Then at the front of the units, you have they're called pods. So all the food comes down from the kitchen raw, and they can cook it themselves. It's like an eight bedroom flat. There's four rooms at one end, four rooms at another, and a shared kitchen in the middle, and two toilet and bathrooms at each end. So if you do well in the pods and don't have any incidents or write-ups or due to urines and you've got people that will vouch for you that are in the pods, like, yeah, we want Joe Blow to come in with us, you can get into there and it's just easier living. Like they're locked at night, but you're not locked in your room in your, in, in your oh, yeah. fucking little house at night. You know, you've got a communal lounge with a big screen, PlayStation, you can go to your room and lock your door whenever you want. Anyway, we were sitting outside. I was out. Fulham has, I think I've heard you mention, like it's got um, L1, L7, Lima 1, Lima 7, Lima 4, Lima 10. I think he's got a jail name similar. That's what the units are named. Oh, well, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. Lima 7 is like the Bronx, the drug unit where nobody's got nothing and that. And I was in a. Uh, I was in a lodge. I'd got out the pot. I was in a lodge, um, sitting out the front one morning, having coffee. You know, three three of us, and then you get the odd straggler. You know, that you don't really know. Oh, how you going, mate? They sit down and have a chat. Don't you know too much about them. Just having a bit of a gossip. <laughs> Next thing you know, you just see this bloke come up and put like a bloody mate. It would have been at least nine inches long. Bit of perspex, like sharpened like a motherfucker. Straight through his neck, in one side, straight out the other side. And then the bloke just walks off, leaving this thing hanging out of this guy's neck. Naughty. Oh, mate, we all just looked at each other like, fuck, did that just happen? We looked at him. 
look back at each other. Fuck yeah, it did just happen. And like we just all backed off and like, mate, you better get yourself down to medical. By this stage, he's like, fucking, you know. I think if they, if we, if he had a pulled it out or tried to pull it out, it probably would have been a lot worse. I would yeah, imagine, it, wouldn't it? <laughs> probably, yeah. But he, yeah, he definitely left it in, and the next thing you know, the alarms are going off for lockdown and things like that. But yeah, certainly seen some crazy things, mate. Some crazy bloody things. So Bendigo, we- back in the day, Bendigo Prison was an old prison like Pentridge built in 1859 or something. Um, it was like a miniature. It only had two wings. It only held 90 prisoners, two small wings, gym down the back. In, in the gym, minding my own business, training away. It was an old prison before CCTV and all that. Next thing you know, bloke's got a 50... Pound 22.25 kg head smashed over, uh, weight smashed over his head and killed for a deal of pot. And did you see, did you witness that? Did you see it as well? I was doing chest presses, but yeah. like, and they just came in and like, but like, I sort of stopped me reps and sort of got up and yeah, yeah, there was about, it wasn't a massive gym because it was a small prison, but like, there would have been at least 12 of us in there. But all of us, mate, intel, like they fucking, and police, like nobody said nothing. We're all crooks, mate. Nobody said yeah. no comment. Oh, yeah. You know, there's no CT. They suspected who it was, but they fucked us all, all sent us, tipped us to Barwon, all got put in Acacia, fucking long-term management for six months. Mm. And then they slowly started letting us all out. Even the ones that was just in their witness that we got punished because nobody would speak. Oh, yeah. So is there, uh, yeah. So what's the most notorious prison in Australia? Was that Barwon? As in for oh, and stuff like that. So David Longlands in Queensland. That's the most. Yeah, so David Longlands was up there in Queensland for sure. Yeah. Here, Barwon's pretty bad, but Port Phillip, absolute wild, wild west. I don't know how many stabbings, bashings. Um, oh. You name it, I've seen it there. When that jail opened, you could buy drugs, any drugs, like you're buying them on the street. Yeah. It was crazy, like private prison, two murders down the slot, I think I briefly spoke to you about. Yeah. Both hectic criminals with big hectic criminal families. One was found allegedly hanging in his cell down the slot. But like when the coroner's report and stuff, the water was found in his lungs. So, you know, obviously yeah. one hectic dude, quickest way for the screws to get rid of him. Mate, they murdered him down the slot and just tried to make it look like fucking he hung himself. But his family, like I said, big criminal family. So all his brothers and cousins, they just come to jail. You know, a lot of them were out for the coroners and autopsy reports and all that. And they there was water in his lungs and this and that that, you know, led to suspect drowning. Uh-huh. This is prison officers, you know what I mean? And another one, uh, Jamie Wheel and Jay Dub, as he was fondly known, very well respected, very dangerous man. Four other brothers as well. So five brothers and the four other brothers were following him, fucking not far behind in his footsteps. So the prison system knew they were going to have their hands full with his family. Down the slot, how do you die of a heroin overdose? Where do you get a needle? Obviously foul clear from the screws. Fucking oath, mate. All the crooks know it. You know, they're saying he smuggled it in his ass. No. You know, you fool it, mate. When you go down the str- slot, mate, you they f- don't just strip you, mate. Like, they fucking make you spread your cheeks, squat, cough three times. Fucking, they're up there with a torch. Like, you know, they're not letting you get into the slot with nothing, mate. Nothing. They x-ray all your stuff when they take it from your normal unit cell into the slot, they x-ray it all before it all goes into the slot. Yeah. To Make sure there's here, nothing. To see them over here, like with the x-ray machine. So obviously they know that you've got nothing when you go in there. So uh, like, yeah, in, in, in inside your stereo or your fan or, you know, whatever you can buy over there, your kettles, we got yeah. to buy all that stuff here. So what's the, um, 
the statistics in Australia for the, like the prisons, how many prisoners is there in the country? Um, I think, I'm not sure. I think it's like for the whole of Australia, I think it's like, it's not, I don't think it'd be fucking, it'd be miles off what you guys have just because of our per capita, you know what I mean? We don't have as many there, people. Over here, I think England and Wales, something like 85,000. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, right, because I think ours is about 60. Is it? Uh, but that's, yeah. That's just, I mean, England, it is. that's just England and Wales. That's not counting like Scotland and Ireland. Oh, that's Scotland, it. Ireland and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, like we are a massive country, but as you know, Rick, the middle of it's empty. There's nothing in there, you know what I mean? Now, it's all built around the coast in Australia. Well, Rick, yeah, so. but it's been here. Uh, we're going to wrap that up now. No worries, mate. But it's been a pleasure having you on. But um, what I'm going to finish with, because obviously I'll always finish with this, um, just to try and deter the kids from going to prison. What would you oh, say? Yeah. What would you say to kids going down that wrong path now, the way we went when we were kids? What advice Mate, would, you give, would you give? Yeah, I, don't, just don't do it, kids. It's it certainly it might seem glamorous. What you see on TV is not what jail is like in real life. It is, it is so glamorized and so far from the truth. You know. <laughs> getting picked up off the street and stuck in the cells for three weeks before you can get to a, a some sort of jail to have a shower and, you, you know, you've got a growth down to your chin and dirty jocks you've been in, you know, for the last three weeks, you've got no family or visitors to bring you anything. It's Jail is not a glamorous life, you know. I recommend kids stay at school, do a trade, bloody get yourself involved in sport and certainly... Don't hang around other kids that are doing crime because then it's just too easy to fall into the same patterns as them because you feel like you just want to fit in. Best to go off and make your own way. Like I used, I did used to say this to young blokes in jail as I was getting older. What's the point of making a name for, your jail, a name for yourself in jail? Unless, you know, one or two high celebrity people have. Make a name for yourself on the outside. That's where you're going to... You know, that's where you're going to excel and succeed on the outside, not making a name for yourself in jail. Yeah, nobody might fight you, but what are you going to gain out of all the years spent in jail? Nothing, nothing. Succeed on the outer. That's that's where, you know, that's where you make it. Absolutely, mate. You hit the nail bang on the head there. But, uh, like I see you, Rick, thanks for coming on. But uh, in the future, we will do a part two. Oh, just like yeah, no worries. Yeah, I've got a few more stories, definitely, mate. Well done to you for keeping yourself clean and uh, keeping yourself out of prison. Should be proud of yourself. Yeah, hell yeah, mate. Yeah, walk on the straight line now, mate. That's for mm-hmm. sure. Have for like I said, nearly ten years now, so can't see myself deviating off it for nothing, mate. For nothing. I mean, you never say never, family things like that. But the way my life's going now, it helps. I I, I saw your messenger profile with your woman i've got a great lady behind me too that i've been with for seven years you know and brilliant can i thank her makes every day for it. it makes so much different and just so much easier to get through the battles oh, yeah. we get through of the institutionalization of trying to adapt into normal society you know to find one that's willing to put up with this until you can settle down and get back into some sort of normality it's it's very hard you know but when you get one that sticks with you mate they're, they're worth yeah. their weight in gold that's for sure absolutely mate so yeah i've definitely got to thank her that's for sure well thanks for watching everybody take care